Kelly, welcome to Australia. It's fantastic to have you a guest, as a guest at the Australian and New Zealand Eurogenital and Prostate Cancer Trials Group uh, annual meeting for 2019. Um, it's especially a pleasure for me to be interviewing you because we've been friends for a number of years and uh, uh, a lot of the uh, those watching this podcast may not be aware that uh, we are in email communication uh, almost every, uh, every couple of days through our involvement with the journal called Prostate Cancer and Prostatic Diseases, where we hold roles as associate editors. Now, it was interesting that when you were introduced to the podium for your talk just now, uh, you were uh, announced as being an endowed chair. Now, that raised a few uh, eyebrows and some smiles from the Australian audience. So how, you, how do you, uh, uh, what's your take on the Australian sense of humour? Yeah, well, it's interesting because th this is the first place I've lectured where it raises eyebrows, uh, which is interesting to me uh, and wonderful. I absolutely uh, love Australia. I love the Australian sense of humor. This is my third uh, trip here. I've come here with my family and uh, I feel very comfortable and welcome here. And uh, moreover, this it's such a dynamic scientific community uh, that you have uh, very, very highly regarded internationally and uh, really, really breaking onto the scene in a very big way, I think, with some of the, uh, the higher profile studies that are getting out there. But of course, I think in, in our particular field, in urology and surgery, uh, you, uh, your community has been very well known for uh, quite a number of years with your work and the work of uh, 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 other Australian urologists. Well, that's great to hear, but I do want to reassure you that we were laughing with you and not at you. <laughs> always, yes, now, always. Now, I get, to, I get to be a little bit uh, more serious about things. Um, you gave the audience uh, in your talk just now some insights about surgeons. Would you like to sort of recap on um, recap on those uh, tra surgical traits that uh, are well known, with amongst, well known amongst ourselves, but yeah. maybe not so well known amongst our multidisciplinary colleagues? Yeah. So I think the, the theme of the conference is making connections, as you know, and uh, having been uh, involved in multidisciplinary clinical trials for close to 14 years now and learning equally from medical oncologists and radiation oncologists and urologists, epidemiologists, statisticians, all these different folks, reflecting on that, reflecting on all those times uh, that I sat in a room and looked around and realized I was the only surgeon in the room, I, I, I wanted to summarize my, my perspective as a, as a urologist, as a surgeon, to a multidisciplinary group, you know, to a room in which we were, frankly, in the minority when we were in there. Uh, and and my, my, my purpose was twofold. My uh, first wanted to convey to folks who are not surgeons, who are not urologists, how we think, um, to help build that bridge of communication so they understand where we're coming from a bit more. And secondly, I wanted to challenge the urologists, the surgeons in the audience, to think about the way they look at the world, think about their perceptions, think about those biases, uh, challenge themselves. I am uh, guilty of all of the biases that I described today. Uh, I, I wrestle with them every single day. I wrestle with them both in my clinical practice uh, and in the clinical trial setting. Well, let's hear about just, just briefly what these five biases are. Yes. So the, the first bias I summarized was uh, uh, often wrong, never unsure. Uh, and, Guilty. Yes, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's part of our ethos as surgeons. You know, we're, we're taught to be confident. Uh, we're, we're taught to have faith in our abilities. And I think because of that, sometimes uh, it, it, it's difficult to change our minds about something. So we, we get ingrained with something. We're comfortable with something. And to present data to the contrary of what we believe uh, I think it's difficult for us to look at those data and say, yes, I should change my practice. Now, I think all physicians uh, have some capacity or, or some tendency to do that. I think that surgeons, though, are particularly... Oh, we do it well. We do it well. We do it very well. We have great <laughs> aptitude for it. Uh, the second one I summarized as, uh, please, not, please do not disturb me. I'm in the operating room. Guilty. Yes. Uh, you know, from our perspective, I think as urologists or as surgeons, we're hyper-focused on what we're doing uh, because we, we have this contract with the patient, this 
um, you know, uh, this faith that we have to keep with the patient to the very best we possibly can while we're, we're operating. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that sometimes it's difficult for us to, um, uh, you know, communicate or, or, or to not think about that, you know, while we're doing that all day for many days a week. Uh, and I think that presents logistical challenges, certainly in terms of uh, setting up meetings, multidisciplinary meetings with our, our coll collaborators in medical oncology and radiation oncology and such. Uh, but it also is a little bit of a mindset. And I, I've seen it kind of creep into some of my colleagues sometimes where I think you can unintentionally project a sense of self-importance without realizing it. You know, don't bother me. I'm operating right now. And, you know, I, the medical oncologist could easily say, don't bother me. I'm in clinic right now. Or don't bother me. I'm, I'm on rounds right now. Um, and, and I think that we have to be wary of that particular uh, tendency sometimes to do that. Uh, the third bias uh, that I discussed uh, was, uh, I know it works, so why bother to test it? Also guilty. Yes, uh, as am I. Uh, so surgeons will oftentimes come up with a new uh, operation or a new technique or something that they have devised. Uh, in our particular field, I would say robotic surgery, certainly. Uh, and then we become very enamored of it. We become absolutely convinced that it's the way to go. Uh, and then we have a tendency to not uh, move toward running, say, a randomized trial, comparing that new therapy to an older one. Uh, and I think that we have to challenge ourselves to do that uh, more often. Uh, the fourth bias I presented is that we like to operate. Uh, guilty. guilty. Love it. Yeah, that's why we went into it. That's why we were drawn to this particular field, because uh, we were drawn uh, to this vocation, to this passion for operating. Uh, I spent many years, eight years, learning how to do what I do, as I'm sure you did and, and uh, all of the other urologist surgeons that are here, uh, and you become very invested in it. And I don't mean invested in a monetary sense, I mean, and certainly, I think in the United States in particular, there could be that component to it. We get paid the more we operate. Um, but it's more than that. It's a worldview. Uh, this is how we were trained. This is how we look at things. We think about surgical cures for diseases. Uh, and I think sometimes we need to take a step back and think, well, is surgery the best way forward? Uh, are there alternative methods? I think a classic example in our particular field is active surveillance. You know, first for prostate cancer. Uh, and I remember active surveillance uh, when it was being presented in, in the mid 2000s, there were people going up to the mic who were very hostile toward it. You know, at, at the oh, meetings, right? Well. Folks were going up to the mic saying, how dare you, you're gonna kill our patients with this. Uh, but the data prevailed, you know, do nothing, first do no harm. And I think that's now started to trend into some of the other things we do, like renal masses, you know, for example. Absolutely, I think it's been wonderful how uh, surgeons have actually uh, embraced and taken charge of treatments that don't, that don't actually involve uh, performing surgery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and the fifth, that's four. So the fifth and yes. final uh, bias that I discussed was, um, we take things personally. Yes, guilty. Yes, and 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 uh, you know, as I mentioned during the talk, how can we possibly not? You know, we we invest ourselves. We have these sacred pacts with patients. Uh, look at the measures that we use when we objectively uh, measure trials of surgery or or the kinds of things that we look at when we do surgical trials: uh, mortality, complications, morbidity, blood loss, transfusions. These cut to the heart of our skills as surgeons and what we, we really believe in. Uh, and so it's hard for us to separate out that emotion uh, from the actual objective measures that we're looking at. You know, I, I always think of it as, uh, you know, I'm operating on someone and I, I, I spend three or four hours operating on somebody um, that could alter the course of their life, completely alter the course of their life. And, and that's, um, you know, that's something that, that's hard often, I think sometimes to separate from the data. How can, you know, taking into account these biases, how can surgeons uh, bring something to the clinical trials landscape? Well, I think, I think uh, we need to be mindful, certainly as surgeons, uh, uh, of our, our particular biases. Uh, and in, in terms of what we bring, I think, yes. to a multidisciplinary clinical trial, uh, I think first and foremost, the, the obvious one is, um, uh, is treatment of localized disease. You know, surgical yep. treatment of localized uh, disease. Absolutely, that's an important component. I often hear folks say, well, you provide tissue. Well, we do and we can, absolutely, and that's part of what we do, but it's, it's not really the most important part of what we do, certainly not in the trial setting. Um, uh, 
the other things I think that we bring to the table are very uh, important uh, ideas about survivorship, uh, listening to our patients, the patients that are treated for localized disease or on, on active surveillance, for example, listening uh, to their thoughts, their feelings, uh, uh, their experiences in their, in their cancer journey and their cancer treatments. Uh, I think the other uh, components that we bring to trials uh, are we, uh, we uh, bring uh, insights into prevention uh, because we're often seeing patients for the first time. We are the first point of contact, and so we tend to think about primary prevention. Some of the big uh, prevention trials in, in prostate cancer, for example, the, the, the primary investigators were urologists. Yes. So you think of uh, the selenium and vitamin E cancer prevention trial, Eric Klein of the Cleveland Clinic, urologist, very esteemed urologist. Uh, he was the uh, senior investigator on that trial. So we bring that component to it. And, and finally, uh, we bring the component, of course, to diagnostics. And I, I, uh, I mentioned uh, that I've already uh, thumbed through the abstract book. I'm uh, here. Yep. Uh, some great science here. I'm looking forward to these presentations and seeing the posters. Uh, There's no question that uh, uh, as the diagnosticians, uh, we are essentially the gatekeepers of cancer. Yeah. So uh, uh, surgeons are always going to play an important part in uh, clinical trials. Kelly, I'd like to thank you again for uh, sharing your insights with us, and we've certainly learned a lot from you already, and we look forward to learning a lot more from you uh, uh, as the program progresses. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's just been absolutely delightful.